We have two scripture readings this morning. The Old Testament reading is Proverbs 1, 20 through 33. Listen for the word of the Lord. Out in the open, wisdom calls aloud. She raises her voice in the public square. On top of the wall, she cries out. At the city gate, she makes her speech. How long will you who are simple love your simple ways? How long will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? Repent at my rebuke. Then I will pour out my thoughts to you. I will make known to you my teachings. But since you refuse to listen when I call, and no one pays attention when I stretch out my hand, since you disregard all my advice and do not accept my rebuke, I will in turn laugh when disaster strikes you. I will mock when calamity overtakes you, when calamity overtakes you like a storm, when disaster sweeps over you like a whirlwind, when distress and trouble overwhelm you. Then they will call to me, but I will not answer. They will look for me, but will not find me, since they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord. Since they would not accept my advice and spurned my rebuke, they will eat the fruit of their ways and be filled with the fruit of their schemes. For the waywardness of the simple will kill them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fear of harm. Our second reading is from James chapter 1, verses 1 through 16. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. Those who doubt should not think they will receive anything from the Lord. They are double-minded and unstable in all they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed are those who persevere under trial, because when they have stood the test, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each of you is tempted when you are dragged away by your own evil desires and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, we're asking you to open your word to us. Shine your light on it that we would see its truth and that the truth would be written on our hearts and that our characters and our, our personalities would be uh, brought into conformity with your word and with, you wanna, with what you want us to be. We thank you for this word where you've revealed yourself to us. We thank you for Dana, his preparation and hard work, and we ask you to honor that. And uh, by your Holy Spirit, give him just the words for us to hear and let it be a life-changing message to us, we pray this day. 
Amen. Thank you, Crystal. I. Uh, And will no one be deceived. What verse did you end on by chance? 16, okay. Oh, sorry, I meant to go a little farther, so I'm going to read uh, verses 17 and 18. Uh, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all that he created. This also is the word of the Lord. (laughs) All right, thank you so much. Uh, What I'm going to do this morning, I'm going to talk about Proverbs for point one. I'm going to talk about James's experience from skeptic to pastor for point two. And then I'm going to talk about the content of James chapter one, verses 18 for point three. But first, I want to tell you about a fun movie that I saw with my daughter Madeline this last summer called Yesterday, the movie about what the world would be like if everybody forgot that the Beatles existed. Have you seen this movie or heard about it? It's a lot of fun. There's a guy in the UK, he's trying to make it as a singer-songwriter, and he's got this faithful friend who keeps encouraging him, but he's not getting anywhere. Then suddenly this electricity storm happens, and somehow kapow, everybody forgets about the Beatles, except for him. He remembers all their songs, so now he's got it made. He's going to be the best singer-songwriter in the world. And there's this scene where he's sitting at the piano in his parents' living room about to play this song that is apparently his for his folks, and it's called uh, Let It Be, right? Sometimes in the time of trouble, yeah, so on. And so he starts playing, and then uh, the doorbell rings. He's like, oh. So it's a friend at the door. So they sit down with a friend and explain, this is a a song called Let Me Be. No, no, let it be. Okay, so, and then the friend, they ask him, interrupt him again, can I get you a drink? And then the phone rings, and finally he just smashes his hands on the piano and says, you're the first people to hear this song. This is like Da Vinci painting the Mona Lisa. Don't Don't you get it? And they're staring at him like, you know, who would talk about their own song like it's this stroke of genius? Nobody would do that. It's ridiculous. But he's talking about that amazing Beatles song that has been all around the world and just changed the face of music and Western culture or whatever you'd want to say about it. Now, that experience, that familiarity breeds contempt that was demonstrated in that living room scene, that's the experience of the person who wrote the book that we're starting to study now, James. James is the brother biologically half-brother of Jesus. He grew up with Jesus. He saw Jesus get hungry. He saw Jesus need to take a nap. Of course, he was the younger brother, so maybe he didn't see that. But he saw Jesus make mistakes and need to sleep and just be an ordinary growing up human being. Maybe he was pigeon-toed for a while when he was a teenager. You know, who knows? His body was growing. He was a normal human being. He was fully human. And then Jesus started his ministry, and in John chapter 7 and in Mark chapter 3, we see that Jesus' own family didn't believe in him. John chapter 7, all of Jesus' brothers are hostile and mocking. Jesus is, the the whole family is supposed to go to Jerusalem for a festival. The brothers know that people are out to get Jesus and want him dead, and they say, go to Jerusalem, show yourself, be public if you're a prophet, knowing that his life's in danger. And Jesus says, no, you go ahead, I'm not going to go. And then he shows up privately. And in Mark chapter 3, Jesus' mother, this is interesting since she's the one that had the virgin birth. Obviously, she didn't think the plan was rolling out the way she expected it. But Jesus' mother and brothers were going to take charge of him like he was crazy. We're going to take custody of you. You're nuts. They didn't believe. That was the James of the year 29 A.D., The James of the year 50 A.D., when this sermon was written, was the bishop of Jerusalem, the most important pastor in the world at that time, the pastor of the apostles, the one that they looked to when they had the question about what to do with Gentiles. When James gave the word, that was the final word, our James. He was called James the Just. 
we could count on him. The, the church could count on him to be unshakable. We could count on him to be solid and make just decisions that were not corrupted by the fear of humanity. He was also called old camel knees because when they carried his dead body after he was killed, 12 years after he wrote this sermon, I'll explain more about that later, when they were preparing him for burial, they saw his knees were leathery and calloused like a camel's knees. He spent hours on his knees on the stone floor of the temple praying for his Hebrew brothers and sisters to repent and trust that Jesus was their Messiah. And as he was dying, he said, Father, forgive them. This is a man who has totally changed. Something happened. There was a transformation. Well, first I'm going to talk about <laughs> that possibly aggravating scripture in Proverbs that you heard read. Uh, Proverbs is there personified as a woman, like Mother Nature, right? Don't fool with Mother Nature. Well, don't fool with wisdom either, because she will laugh at you if you don't listen to her, and then everything blows up. Now, if this were a real person, she would be annoying to me. <laughs> I don't like it when people tell me what to do and then laugh at me <laughs> if, if I fail. But wisdom is not a person, and wisdom as an objective reality has the right to tell us what to do the way a lighthouse has the right to tell a ship what to do the lighthouse can say if you ignore my signals i'll just laugh at you when you're on the rocks now it sounds mean but it's trying to demonstrate a reality that wisdom is right there in front of us when it says that she calls out in the marketplace it's like saying to Jesus' brother, there's the incarnate Son of God right in front of your eyes. And wisdom is all around us. The book of Proverbs says that you can look at an ant on the ground and find wisdom from it because that ant doesn't have anybody cracking the whip, but all day long, all summer long, it's gathering food so that when the snow covers it up, it'll have something to eat. Wisdom, it's there for us to see, and we need to pay attention to it, but so often we don't, like James who had Jesus more than any other kid on his block. He saw more Jesus than all the thousands that were fed by the fish and the bread. By all the people that waved the palm branches, he saw more Jesus than any of them. And yet he didn't believe because familiarity breeds contempt. There's a, a phenomenon called snow blindness. Pretty fitting illustration for today, I'd say. It's when you have a lot of bright light and a lot of snow and not much else, just tons of ultraviolet light and white. And you can hurt your eyeballs and lose your ability to see and discern what it is you're looking at because you have so much revelation, so much light, so much in your eyes that you can't see anymore. That was James before something happened. So what was it that happened? How did he go from being James the hostile doubter to James the pastor of the apostles? maybe the most precious pastor bishop we've ever had what happened i think the answer to that is in first corinthians chapter 15 when the apostle paul is telling the christians in corinth look you got to understand we're not preaching greek philosophy here the christian life is not about the immortality of the soul or just some vague spiritual realm it's about the resurrection of the body physically from the dead and Jesus Christ is the first fruits of that. He uses that phrase again. Jesus physically raised is the foundation of your faith. If you've only trusted Jesus for this life and you don't believe in the coming resurrection from the dead, you are to be pitied above all people, Paul says. And then to show the evidence of what he's teaching, he says, look, when Jesus rose from the dead, he made these appearances. I talked last week about him appearing to 500 in Galilee. He appeared to Peter and to James, he says. Now, it was important to say Peter because Peter was the foremost apostle and important to say James because James was the foremost pastor. James, our James. What happened? Well, what happened is this resurrected Jesus who would show up behind closed doors and show up uninvited, unexpected, showed up somehow for James and said, now do you recognize me? Now do you know who I am? Now who, do you know who's been with you all this time? 
And the impact on James's life was unquestionable. I've been researching in the last week uh, NDEs, near-death experiences. It's the most interesting inter intersection between science and faith that we have right now because there are peer-reviewed scientific journals that study near-death experiences. A near-death experience is when somebody has no heart and no brain activity, and yet they have memories of what happened in that period of time when they had no brain activity and no heartbeat. Sometimes they, this is written in scientific journals, they can tell you what happened in the room next door in a surgery with details. Uh, they can, and so anyway, I encourage you to research it, but one of the phenomena that goes on with these NDEs is that people's lives change. They change their lives. There's something that, that this encounter with the, the eternal changes the course of their life. So James had an encounter that changed the direction of his life, and that's how he became James the Just, an old camel knees. And that's why he writes what he writes to us. Now, the content that we saw in the first 18 verses of James may seem a little harsh. I do like this about the book of James, though. It's kind of four-wheel drive, kind of rugged. It's a rugged book that gets right to the point. Some have contrasted it with the Apostle Paul and his beautiful theology. It will end up having the same theology and tell us to live by faith, ultimately. But it's uh, rough and rugged, and part of that is because it's, he's, a, he's a Hebrew. He's a Jewish believer, and he's preaching to his Jewish family. And he's using uh, literary, literary devices that are common. And so while it looks like this letter has a strange structure or no structure at all, repeats things, and it looks like uh, some things seem exaggerated, that's because those are literary devices in Hebrew poetry and Hebrew writing. And this section we read seems to have ideas that aren't connected to each other, but I'm going to tell you today there's a thread of logic. When he talks about trials, wisdom, faith without doubting, humility, temptation, gifts that come from the Father, and being born by the word of truth. This is the logic. Because Christ is risen, and we see that his plan as Messiah is not exactly what we thought, but that our call is to follow a suffering Messiah and to become like Christ so that in due time we could share in his glory. Because of that, these trials and temptations are not bad, they're good. That's the first case he makes. They count it pure joy. That pure joy, that's a Hebrew uh, um, w exaggeration. You know, it's a way of making a point in that way of speaking that means get into this. Really understand this. Count it pure joy when you face these trials. There's that sense of exaggeration when he says, don't be double-minded. I used to think, man. I'm going to have to scale back just to get to double-minded. I'm triple-minded. I'll change my mind so many times, I can't even remember what I thought the first time. But what he means is be single-minded, be uh, committed to the truth. Believe. This call for wisdom. Uh, he's a, a person who lived with wisdom and didn't see it. And so in his transformation, he's calling this to the, all these things, wisdom, humility, temptation, trials, they all have this common line of logic saying it's not about how we feel in this moment, but about the transformation we experience to become more like Christ. And ultimately, the power that we have to be transformed is the gift of God. It's the gift of God. So, uh, uh, imagine... <laughs> Imagine for a moment somebody who uh, goes to the doctor because they're suddenly not feeling well. And this is a person who has been trained, trained from their childhood to understand that comfort is good for you. Comfortable things make you well, and uncomfortable things make you ill. And so they seek comfort. And the doctor says, you know, we've got a few problems, this and that, and your bone density is low, and so I want you to... Um, do some physical therapy. You're going to need to become a member of this athletic club and meet with a personal trainer. 
great. So show up at the athletic club and there's a personal trainer. Here's the tanning bed. Here's the massage chair. Here's the sauna. Person thinks, oh, my doctor's a genius. This is fantastic. That's going to feel great. All that sunshine and the warm air and the massage. And the, you know, the trainer says, okay, go change and meet me at this bench. And the person thinks, bench, I love sitting. This is, it's so comfortable. This is wonderful. I love this place. I don't know what, uh, you know, maybe when the person said dumbbells, they were referring to all these other people who are working so hard because I don't understand what they're doing. Meet me on the bench by the dumbbells. Okay, so he sits down at the bench, and the trainer says, go pick up those dumbbells. Oh, it's those metal things. The person thinks, I hope they're hollow because those look really heavy if those are solid metal. Thinks they're stuck, picks them up, struggles, gets them over the bench. Then the trainer says, good job, you lifted them. Now you're going to lift them over your head 10 times in a row, three sets of 10. And that's when the person says, oh, there must be a mistake. My doctor's a fool. This isn't going to work. And the trainer has to explain, no, you become well through the pain of resistance, the pain of resistance training. When we endure trials... We're resisting the temptation to give up on our faith or give up on the goodness of God, give up on life. Trials are terrible. I hate trials. You hate them too. We don't like grief. We don't like pain. But there's a redemptive quality that's possible because of Jesus. Jesus died on the cross. Jesus didn't just teach and perform miracles. Jesus entered our suffering. And through that suffering, we enter his glory. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. First the cross and then the crown. It's resistance to giving up in those hard times that builds us up. And the goal is not comfort. The goal is transformation. The goal is to become more like Christ. You'll be mature, complete, lacking nothing, lacking nothing in your transformation, becoming like Christ. And, and when it says uh, in verse 12, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. In other translations, it says you're blessed when you're tempted. It goes on to talk about how temptation comes from our own bad selves, like uh, wasted away in Margaritaville. It's my own darn fault. That's what James is saying about temptation. You have to face it that that evil is in you. But you're blessed when you resist. Resistance training, when you resist that temptation. It's coming from you. It's not the devil made you do it. It's not somebody else's fault. You want to do wrong because that bad is in you. But when you resist it and say no to it, you're blessed. Uh, when you stand the test, you'll receive the, receive the crown of life. First the cross and then the crown. Part of that cross is denying yourself. So, th this, is, this is the message that, that James is giving us, that we, we're not here for comfort, we're here for transformation. The goal is not comfort, it's transformation. But the real thing that's going to change us is an encounter. Now, if we get this mindset that our Christian life is not about comfort, but it's about transformation, it's about becoming like Christ who bore the cross for us, then we start to see... Uh, excuse me, and add to it the reality that we are given birth through a word of truth, uh, that there is something that happens that dramatically changes us. When James met his brother, risen from the dead, and realized you're the son of God, that was the word of truth that changed James. We've ex either are soon to experience this transformation or have experienced this transformation and therefore the goal is no longer comfort but becoming like Christ. I think that we would start, that. well, I want to call us to start to see our Christian lives a little differently. All right, this is written in 50 AD. It's either the first or second letter written in the New Testament. At that time, you could not carry a Bible to Bible study. You know, you had scrolls in synagogues, and the New Testament wasn't written yet. He's preaching it right here. And so James, who's this foremost pastor, has to be a foremost pastor with a thinner Bible than ours that he's not carrying around everywhere. And he didn't have uh, devotionals with glassy photos or Christian conferences, didn't have Christian music, 
didn't have uh, the, the, all these things that we take for granted. We have more access to Bibles than any other generation has had. But they had a faith that we long for. Now, the difference is that the power of James's faith was based on that encounter. And you cannot schedule an encounter. The only thing you can do is schedule your availability. So, so the point I want to make here is that when you sing a song, when you read the Bible, when you read a devotional, when you go to Bible study, when you go to church, when you listen to a Christian song, watch a Christian TV show, talk to a Christian friend, when you do any of these things, if you would have in your mind that the foremost goal of any activity like that is encounter with Jesus. Not just fresh knowledge, not just satisfaction of having done the right thing, but an encounter with Jesus. There are times when I read the Bible and my eyes begin to water, and my heart is struck. And times when I read the Bible and that doesn't happen. There are times when I sing a song and it's like the heavens are parted and I can suddenly experience the tremendous love that God has for people and has for me. And there are times when I'm actually thinking about what I forgot to do an hour ago. (laughs) That's why I get the words wrong. You know, there are times when I come to church and I'm just in awe at something that happens and times when I come to church and I'm mostly thinking about not goofing it up for other people. I can't schedule an encounter with Jesus, but I can say that the best thing that could happen when I engage in any of these activities is that encounter with Jesus. That's where the transformation comes. That's what drives this worldview that transformation is more important than comfort. So this is what I'll call you to uh, as the end game of this sermon, this message. Either A, schedule your availability so that you can encounter Jesus as a risen Lord for the first time, the way that James did. You may be swamped with Christian light, with enlightenment, with knowledge about Christian things. You may know a lot about it, but have never really experienced an encounter that's changed your life. Uh, My call to you is to schedule your availability and your openness to receive that encounter. Now, if you have, if you've encountered Jesus in a way that's changed your life, my reminder to you is to never take for granted all the opportunities you have to encounter him again. It's encounter with Jesus that drives the transformation of your life forward and helps you to experience some of the hardest things in life as things that make you better, things that conform you to the image of Christ. And lastly... As it says in verse 17, every good and perfect gift comes from God, the the gift of wisdom that you can ask for, the gift of seeing God in the obvious, the gift of encounter with God. These things of wisdom and faith, they come from a giving God whose character you can always trust. So if you would walk away from church today having softened your heart and recommitted yourself to trusting the character of God, whether you're spiritually dry or in the revival of a lifetime, just trusting God that he can show up, that you can encounter God in the most ordinary activities, and that your thirst and your hunger is to encounter him afresh, then you will have received what uh, I hope you received this morning. So may the Lord bless you. May the Lord fill you with desire to encounter him. Amen.